Good evening, I'm Jake Ward coming to you from the NBC News Bureau in San Francisco. Here are some of the stories we are following now tonight. Rescuers in Alabama are going door to door looking for people who might not have survived yesterday's powerful storms. As the full extent of the devastation remains unclear, we're on the ground in Autauga County. Last month, the Trump Organization was found guilty of felony tax fraud and more than a dozen other crimes. Today, Trump's family business was ordered to pay a fine. We'll tell you how much that was. High-level diplomacy takes center stage at the White House as the president talks weapons and troops with Japan's prime minister. We'll explain. The Treasury Secretary warns Congress to raise the debt limit or face far-reaching economic damage. There's been a bipartisan cooperation when it comes to uh, lifting the debt ceiling, and that's how it should be. And remember that story from last week of the six-year-old who allegedly shot his first grade teacher? Well, it turns out a school employee searched his backpack after being tipped off that he may have had a weapon. At least nine people are dead tonight and thousands are still without power after powerful storms released a series of tornadoes that touched down in Alabama and Georgia yesterday. A state of emergency was declared in both states. Today, in Alabama, rescuers raced to find survivors. The National Weather Service confirms a tornado in Selma, Alabama, delivered winds as high as 135 miles per hour. A statement from Selma's mayor is urging people to stay off the roads. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey toured damage today along with Senator Katie Britt and Congresswoman Terry Sewell. While surrounded by flattened homes, they spoke to homeowners and survivors. Far worse than anything I had envisioned or seen on television. Roofs are just gone. And trees look like toothpicks. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done here. And I know we're going to pull it together and get this done. We've Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky in Autauga County, Alabama. M Morgan, what are you hearing from survivors on the ground at this hour? Yeah, Jake, it's going to be a long road ahead, no doubt. Autauga County, one of the hardest hit areas in this entire storm system. Authorities say at least seven people died as a result of these multiple reported tornadoes. We know the National Weather Service was trying to survey some of the damage areas today, but we had a chance to speak to the family who used to call what's behind me home. This belonged to the Johnson family. Uh, and believe it or not, two people, Amber Johnson and her two-year-old son, rode out this tornado inside what's left of this home. I want you to hear what they have to say about this incredible ordeal in their own words. I felt it pick us up and we leaned forward a little bit and then I'm not really sure what happened after that. I was hit in the head and um, I stood up uh, about right over there, I guess. He's okay. He has um, two stitches and some glue on his forehead and that's that's really it. Jake, they were hiding in a bathtub when this tornado struck. They were thrown outside of it, uh, landing uh, about 10 yards behind me. That bathtub that they were in, meanwhile, tossed about 50 yards farther, landing in a ditch. Uh, just one story of so many of how people survive this. But unfortunately, they, uh, the Johnson family themselves, know some of the people uh, who were lost as a result of these storms. Jake. So terrifying, those poor people. Morgan, while, while touring damage in Selma, I understand Governor Kay Ivey met with survivors and local leaders like Mayor James Perkins Jr. Tell us a little bit about the recovery efforts they're trying to put together. Right. The damage in Selma has been described as absolutely widespread. We know that particularly hit hard was the power grid there. Tens of thousands of people still in the dark right now as they're trying to get those poles back up and running and lines strung across. Uh, but this is a historic community, and there were some iconic areas, uh, neighborhoods that were hit in the midst of this storm. And despite the damage, though, city leaders undeterred. Here's what they had to say. Thank you all so very much for coming on uh, your concerns you're expressing for the citizens of Selma. We got a lot of work to do, but we're some strong, resilient folks here. Yes, you are. We're going to pull this thing back together, but we're going to need some help. <laughs> and so I came out to just thank you and to ask for help. Uh, you know, you, if you don't ask, sometimes you don't get because you don't ask. And so we want to just thank you and ask you for the support that we need. 
And speaking of help, we know that federal help will be headed this way. At least six counties in Alabama have had states of emergencies declared. The entire state of Georgia has issued that courtesy of the governor. That came last night. Uh, but just in the time span of today, uh, we saw the unofficial sources of help, neighbors and volunteers clearing roads, helping families go through what's left of their home, searching for anything they could salvage uh, for this this surprising, shocking storm that left uh, just an incredible amount of damage right in the middle of January. Not unheard of, Jake, but uh, certainly not expected here. Back to you. Alabama really dealing with the unimaginable. NBC's Morgan Chesky on the ground for us. Thank you so much. We turn now to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens for the latest forecast. Bill, as we just heard from Morgan, people in the South have a lot of cleanup ahead of them. What, what is the forecast uh, there this weekend? Yeah, you saw Morgan all bundled up, too. It's a chilly wind that has moved through the south. Thankfully, though, they're not seeing anything in the form of rain and snow. And, you know, a lot of people are starting to wonder, like, we've had a bunch of severe weather events this winter alone, December and now January, through the south. And this is getting more common. It's not just, you know, you and me, your imagination. Uh, there's actually been studies done on this. So we did end up with 37 tornado reports. The fatalities were in areas of Alabama and also in areas of Georgia. Uh, but this one as far north as Areas of Kentucky. So what we do know is that Tornado Alley, the traditional Tornado Alley that we knew in the 80s and 90s, has been shifting. There's less tornadoes now. We still get big ones and we still get outbreaks, but Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas are getting less, and we're starting to see more increasing mm -hmm. in areas what we call the Tennessee Valley. So from Memphis to Little Rock, Mississippi, and, and areas of Alabama, like where we saw all the tornadoes yesterday. And one of the reasons why, and one of the reasons that we had yesterday's event is because the Gulf of Mexico continues to be be much warmer than it should. We just finished this year being the fifth warmest year on record, and all that warmth is accumulating in the ocean. So when we have storms like yesterday, the warm, humid air is tapped. That's the fuel for thunderstorms. So a warmer Gulf of Mexico can equal additional tornadoes than we typically would see years ago, Jake. It's really extraordinary, Bill, to imagine, right? A, a generation ago, you'd be just, you know, telling us about the commute, but we're in this moment where you are showing us moment by moment how the earth is changing. It is yeah. really extraordinary to watch it with you. And, and not to, you know, always steer it back to California, but I'm trying to figure <laughs> out my weekend plans. We're all keeping an eye on storms coming in California. What can we expect in the coming days? So we got three. It looks like three storms, and each one is going to be bigger than the next one. The storm we've had today has not caused many significant problems. We don't think it would. And actually, in whole, all three by themselves would not be a big issue. But because of the ground so wet, we've had all the issues out there, the water so, say, you know, so everywhere, that one, by the time we get to the Monday, Tuesday event, that's when we could see the most significant impact. So that's why we had 15 million people under flood watches. We only have three locations right now with river flood warnings. We don't have any flash flood warnings whatsoever. And you can see the rain from that first storm is even a break right now in San Francisco, still snowing pretty good in the mountains. But all the bright white clouds, this is the next batch that's going to be heading in. And it does look like it's going to be one after another. Saturday, then Sunday night into Monday. So here's how it's all going to time out. I'll pause this at 8 p.m. on Saturday and notice the rain centered right over the top of Los Angeles. If you have your Saturday evening plans, hit and miss showers, maybe even more thunderstorms around San Francisco and windy conditions in the northwest. Then we get a little bit of a break Sunday morning and here comes that next slug of moisture Sunday night and this will last into Monday and Tuesday. That Monday event looks to be more Southern California's problem. So if we're going to hear about major issues with power outages, trees down, uh, dealing with huge surf issues, that's going to be Santa Barbara into L.A., more, not so much San Francisco northward. So when we add it all up, all three storms total, the rainfall is going to be about one to five inches. The Bay Area, especially in the Northern Bay, could be that three-inch total. And as you know, that will cause some issues by the time we get towards Monday and Tuesday. And even in L.A., that one one inch, not a big deal, but if we get it all at the same time, this is what we'll worry about, the landslide threat throughout the region, especially in any of those burn scar areas, Jake. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, a slam after slam. It has been a big, big week with NBC's Bill Karens. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you. Former President Donald Trump's organization will have to pay a $1.6 million fine as part of punishment for tax fraud. The Trump organization was found guilty on 17 counts, including conspiracy and falsifying business records. But this is not the end of legal troubles for the former president. NBC investigative correspondent Tom Winter has more. 
The judge who oversaw the trial against the former president's namesake company, the Trump Organization, and several companies underneath it, which were indicted several years ago on tax fraud related schemes and charges, and also oversaw the guilty plea of its CFO, Alan Weisselberg, a right hand man to the Trump family and their business over the years, today imposed a fine of $1,610,000 against the Trump Organization following their conviction in a jury's guilty verdict. Uh, over a month ago, the judge today determining that they would get the maximum amount of fine. District Attorney Alvin Bragg, whose office oversaw the case in the trial, says that New York state law should be looked at potentially to see if additional fines or the amount of fines that can be imposed in a case like this in the future, not involving or impacting this case, should be raised because the number, most analysts say, is surely a drop in the bucket for the president's company. His companies over the years have had to divest properties. There's been numerous reports that suggest that the companies are not doing as well as they perhaps once did, or at least prior to former President Trump uh, being in the White House. Still, though, the fine uh, will likely likely easily be covered by the company, experts admit. As far as the company and the former president and his family moving forward with the investigations that have consumed him in New York State over the past several years, the criminal aspect is really now over. He still faces the New York Attorney General's civil suit, which has been directly filed against the Trump Organization, the former president, and his children. Uh, but there have been no signs of any additional activity in the ongoing criminal investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, although Alvin Bragg, the person who is the district attorney, says that that investigation is ongoing and says that there may be aspects of it that are outside of our purview. Uh, moving forward, uh, the uh, Trump uh, civil case uh, is potentially going to trial this year, and that's the next thing that needs to be monitored in New York State. Of course, outside of the Mar-a-Lago document special counsel and the ongoing criminal investigation in Georgia also impacting the former president. Tom Winter reporting for us. The U.S. might soon be unable to borrow money to pay its bills. Today, in a letter to Congress, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. could hit its debt limit by next Thursday, January 19th. Yellen told House Speaker Kevin McCarthy that the Treasury will have to take extraordinary measures to avoid a default. She warned that with no action, the U.S. could default on its debt by early June. Jared Bernstein is a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, and he joins us now. Jared, thank you so much for being here. For, for all of us non-economists out there, what is the significance of the debt ceiling? Why is the government being able to borrow money important, and how does that affect average Americans? Well, let's start with the latter point and uh, about the effect to average Americans, because uh, I just think uh, it, it's hard to convey just how damaging and devastating this will be uh, to the U.S. economy and even the global economy. Here's a quote from the letter that uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen sent up to the Hill today. Failure to meet the government's obligations would cause irreparable harm to the U.S. economy, the livelihoods of all Americans, and global financial stability. And I will tell you that we're hearing similar kinds of comments from the Chamber of Commerce and groups on all sides of the political aisle. The reason for that, to get to your question, is that if we don't raise the debt ceiling, the U.S. is unable to meet its spending obligations. Obligations, to be very clear, that this Congress has already agreed upon. These are past prior spending obligations, including uh, uh, paying uh, uh, the uh, uh, debt to our bondholders, but also Social Security, paying our military, uh, paying for uh, the agencies that inspect our food and our water and, our, and keep, our, keep our planes moving. So at any rate, that's just a thumbnail sketch of what's at stake here. And Jared, I mean, spell out for me the worst case scenario, right? How do the ripple effects work? Let's say that we somehow are no longer in a uh, place where the government can pay its debts. How does that spread out? How does that affect the global markets? Why is it that we're this central pillar and, and the sure. debt limit, uh, you know, could, could damage it? Well, we happen to be uh, the largest and one of the most important uh, economies in the world. Of course, uh, our debt is considered, our sovereign debt, meaning the debt that our uh, government borrows when it sells treasury bonds, is considered uh, the most safe debt uh, in the world, the m most highly respected debt in the world. Um, but, you know, your question is a perfectly legitimate one. But before we go there, 
let's just talk about the fact that the debt ceiling has been raised 80 times in recent decades. The debt ceiling was raised three times in a bipartisan manner under President Trump. So sure, we can talk about worst case scenarios, and I think it's a valid question. I'll get into it with you. But we shouldn't even be considering going there as if that's some sort of a viable possibility. We have an mm -hmm. economy that, thanks to President Biden's economic plans, is really uh, helping a lot of people, particularly through uh, the strongest job market in 50 years. We're seeing improvements on the inflation front, more to go there, but we're seeing some movement in the right direction. The idea that uh, Congress, and, and we know that's the House Republicans that are, are making these noises, would undermine that by failing to raise the debt ceiling that's been raised, uh, as I mentioned, dozens and dozens of times throughout history is uh, just a uh, you know, it's really, it's just malpractice is what it is. Let me ask you a question about that then. I mean, we're seeing certainly the words debt limit used in political circles more and more, right? So House leader Kevin McCarthy was on Fox this week and he said this about the debt limit. Have a, have a look at this. One of the greatest threats we have to this nation is our debt. It makes us weak in every place that we can. We have never been at this high of debt to GDP except during World War II. And what are we funding? wasteful Washington spending much of the time. You know, for those of us at home, right, the idea of having debt sounds like a very, very bad thing. And what he's saying there seems calculated to, to try and strike that kind of nerve. What I want to ask you here is, is he right? Does our debt as a nation make us weak? Uh, not at all. Uh, first of all, um, the, the key point there, though, and I, I, again, I'll answer your question, but I think uh, um, the House leader is engaging in a, a kind of sleight of hand there in the following sense. If Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans believe that we should lower the debt, they have every right and even every obligation to their constituents, if that's their position, to write new spending bills, future spending bills, that reduce our debt, either raise revenues or cut spending. That's uh, absolutely their prerogative. But raising the debt ceiling is necessary to pay spending obligations for which we have already agreed, okay? Funding our military, paying our Social Security recipients, uh, paying our bondholders. These are debts. These are obligations that Congresses, this Congress and other Congresses, have already endorsed, have already signed off on. It's exactly analogous to having your dinner at the restaurant and saying, I'm not going to pay for this meal uh, because there have been too many meals that we've been having lately. Uh, it's mm. just really a non sequitur. Again, if they want to take action on further spending to reduce the debt, um, go ahead and uh, introduce bills. Joe Biden has shown that deficit reduction is something he's pretty good at, $1.7 trillion over his first couple of years. But not paying current obligations, that's unacceptable. Jared Bernstein of the White House Council of Economic Advisors uh, illustrating the debt limit and, and the dangers of walking out on the check. Jared, thank you so much. Taking you next to the White House, where President Biden told Japan's prime minister that the U.S. is completely committed to its alliance. More details out of those talks. Plus, all of this is happening as a special counsel was named to investigate Biden's handling of classified documents. We'll take a look at what happens next. We have said that we are going to continue to continue to fully co cooperate. We have been. Uh, uh, the president's lawyers and team has been fully cooperating uh, with the Department of Justice, and we're certainly they're certainly going to do that with uh, the special counsel. Let's turn now to the special counsel investigation into President Biden's ha mishandling of classified documents. Today, in a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland, House Republicans announced their own investigation into Biden's handling of classified documents found both at a Washington, D.C. office and at his Delaware home. Also, a senior U.S. official and another person familiar with the matter tells NBC News that one of the classified documents found at the Washington, D.C. office was marked as top secret. That's the highest classification in the U.S. government. The White House has declined to comment on this development. That said, the Justice Department is now overseeing two investigations led by special counsels into the mishandling of classified documents, both by the current president and by his predecessor, former President Donald Trump. Carol Lamb is a former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of California, and she is also an NBC News legal analyst. She joins us now. Carol, thanks so much for being here. Tell me, what does the appointment of a special counsel indicate 
about possible wrongdoing here? I mean, do you only appoint a special counsel when there is a sense that criminality has taken place? Well, a special counsel really serves the same purpose that a regular prosecutor serves. It's just in highly unusual circumstances that we have here, where potentially one of the subjects of the investigation is a sitting president of the United States, and the Justice Department works for the president of the United States. So what the attorney general has done here is actually not that surprising, uh, because he originally asked the U.S. attorney for the Chicago area to take a look at this and indicate whether a special counsel should be appointed. That U.S. attorney, Mr. Lausch, said, yes, I think he should. And by the way, I'm leaving the Department of Justice, so I don't want to be that person. And mm. in that in that instance, really, I think Merrick Garland had no choice but to appoint a special counsel. It does not necessarily mean that there's criminality here. It just means that criminality couldn't be ruled out in time. And, Carol, what about these, these most recent developments? I mean, right, if you're on that team and you find out that one of these documents had the actual top-secret designation, that top-classified designation, does that make you pay attention in a new way, right? Do you, are you woken out of your, out of, you know, in the middle of the night of, over that kind of thing? I mean, does that make this investigation a lot more serious? Sure. Nobody, nobody who has left the position wants to hear that they have somehow uh, been found out to have misplaced a top secret document that is that's a very very serious thing but you know it does happen and i think we've seen that it happens in all sorts of different contexts and uh, the unusual situation here that merrick garland is faced with is that it has happened with the two front runners to be running for president in the next election that is highly unusual but mm -hmm. yes there there are misplacements of classified documents all the time if it is a top secret document of course it is a more serious situation and of course, you know, White House Press Secretary Karen uh, Jean-Pierre was asked earlier today about why the White House took so long to disclose information. Here's what she said. It's an ongoing process because, again, it is an ongoing process. There is a process here. The Department of Justice is independent. We respect that process. But again, I have taken questions. I can take two, two questions through 100 questions. I have answered your questions uh, as uh, almost every day on this issue. And again, anything else that you may have, anything that's related to the review, I would refer you to one, the Department of Justice. Question. Carol, does the White House have an obligation, in your view, to share this information with the public? You know, does the fact that they are not disclosing that info uh, affecting the special counsel's investigation at all, do you think? I don't think the fact that the White House isn't disclosing information to the public in a public setting like that with a, with a press secretary not making a comment, I don't think that affects the special counsel's investigation at all. He will have his own mechanisms. Uh, he has the grand jury uh, authority. He can he can interview people. He can uh, depose people. But I think what you're witnessing here is a great deal of caution by the White House, because to say nothing is one thing, but to say something and then be proven later to have misstated or misinterpreted or, or mm. even innocently misrepresented something uh, can be taken out of context and, and uh, cast a pall over everything. And so I think when, when she says this is a process, I think what she means is we don't know everything yet. And until we do know everything, we are reluctant to come out and say anything affirmatively. Former federal prosecutor Carol Lamb with some important insight on a delicate process. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Stepping up security. That was one of the biggest concerns during President Biden's meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. It comes amid provocative military actions from Japan's neighbors, China and North Korea. Let me be crystal clear. The United States is fully, thoroughly, completely committed to the alliance. And more importantly, to Japan's defense. <clears throat> the defense of Japan. After that meeting, the U.S. and Japan signed an agreement to bolster cooperation in space. This was, of course, the end of Prime Minister Kishida's week-long tour of Washington. NBC's Mike Mamoli has more. 
Yeah, Jake, obviously the appointment yesterday of a special counsel in this classified document probe overshadowing things at the White House. But President Biden trying to put the focus Friday on foreign policy as he welcomed Fumio Kishida uh, to the Oval Office, the first time Kishida visiting Washington since becoming Prime Minister of Japan more than a year ago. Now, these two leaders focused on a major priority for Kishida as he has vowed to uh, in significantly increase Japanese defense spending and enter into a ramped up military cooperation with the United States. As part of Kishida's visit today, as well as others yesterday with Secretary of State Tony Blinken, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, and their Japanese counterparts, the U.S. and Japan have agreed that the U.S. will increase its military presence on the island of Okinawa. They're also going to step up their anti-ship capabilities with an eye towards deterring China from a potential invasion of the island of Taiwan. Now, President Biden's foreign policy has really been guided by this idea that the 21st century is going to be shaped by this battle between autocracies like Russia and China and democracies like the United States. And President Biden, as he welcomed Kishida to the Oval Office, really underscoring the importance of Japan in this idea. Take a listen. We're modernizing our military alliance, building on Japan's historic increase in defense spending and new national security strategy. Kishida coming to Washington after visits to Canada, the United Kingdom, and France. If you notice a trend here, those are all members of the G7. And President Biden is going to be attending the G7 summit hosted by Kishida in Hiroshima later this year. It'll be his second time visiting Japan in less than a year, really underscoring the importance of this alliance. Jake? It's time now for some of the big headlines that we are watching tonight. Kevin Spacey pleaded not guilty to seven more sex offense charges today in a London court. The actor was accused of multiple sexual assaults against one man between 2001 and 2004. His indictment today is now combined with another five count indictment to which he previously pleaded not guilty. A pre-trial set for April will determine whether or not Spacey will face trial on all 12 charges. A group of shareholders is suing Southwest Airlines after its winter travel meltdown. The class action lawsuit accuses the airline of downplaying or not noting previous issues in its scheduling system. The shareholders claim they've suffered, quote, significant losses and damages because the company's market value has dropped. This comes as CEO Bob Jordan took responsibility for the meltdown this week, saying in part, it's on me at the end of the day. President Biden is set to deliver his second State of the Union address on February 7th. He accepted a formal invitation today from Speaker McCarthy to address Congress. The speech will be Biden's first address as president to a Republican-controlled House. A new report from the Pentagon reveals over 350 UFO sightings were reported since March of 2021. Granted, about half of them appear to be either balloons or drones, but this one's still significant. The majority of these sightings came from Navy and Air Force personnel. The Department of Defense notes a reduced stigma around reporting these events could possibly explain the increase. The total number of tracked UFO cases now stands at 510. And in Boston, a massive new sculpture honoring Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta Scott King, debuted today. The bronze structure titled Embrace depicts the arms, shoulders, and hands of the kings hugging after Martin received a Nobel Peace Prize. The iconic 1964 moment once documented in this famous photo is now memorialized in downtown Boston. And the structure stands in the very spot where King once led thousands in the Northeast's first march of the civil rights era. According to Moscow's defense ministry, Russian forces have seized the Ukrainian town of Solidar. Now, Ukrainian officials deny this claim, and NBC News has not verified either one of these claims. Now, if the eastern city has indeed fallen, it would represent the first Russian victory in months. Regardless, though, take a look at these aerial images of Solidar. The city has endured some of the most intense fighting of the war, and the devastation is clear. Meanwhile, Russians are still reeling from the attack in Makivka about two weeks ago. Sky News Moscow correspondent Diana Magne has the story. It's almost two weeks since the strike on Makivka, a U.S.-made HIMARS missile which killed, Russia says, 89 of its servicemen, the Ukrainians say as many as 400. The largest mass casualty that Russia has admitted to so far in this war, and a strike they blamed on the soldiers themselves for supposedly using their mobile phones. Many of the men came from in and around the southern city of Samara, a terrible start to the new year here. 
The funeral's happening every day now. Burial notices, though, kept under wraps. Relatives ordered to keep quiet. The freshly bereaved, desperately sad and desperately angry. She was incredibly upset, refused to talk to us, said that she hated foreigners, said, why are you helping the Ukrainians? And that's just a constant refrain. You can understand from someone who's just that lost their relative. Why, why is the West helping Ukraine at the cost of our loved ones? No lists of those who died, though, in line with the Ministry of Defence's policy of keeping a lid on the true cost of this war. It makes even basic news gathering hard and frustrating. But we do find the occasional glimpse of honesty. People are dying for nothing, only because of one fool, this woman says. Comms now are carefully managed by the regional governor. He held a video link-up for surviving soldiers with their relatives back home, the PR they want to put out. <laughs> One serviceman told of the arrival of his baby girl the night before and other messages of support for the troops come home with victory, their wives tell them. In Samara itself, there's not much now to mark what happened. Just this graffiti, Samara Makayevka, we remember, we mourn. The artist too patriotic, he said, to give Sky News an interview. But we do find skeptics, those who don't agree with what's happening, even if they're scared to say much. But there aren't many like him. And in this city hit by recent tragedy, we meet not so much sorrow as just silence. Russia's home front forced to hide its scars behind closed doors. Diana Magne, Sky News, Samara, Russia. And we're getting more information on the FAA outage that grounded departures across the nation. They contributed to roughly 11,000 delayed flights on Wednesday. The Department of Transportation believes contract employees damaged critical files in the NOTAM system. That's the one used to get pilots important safety information in the air. We are now learning that that software is, get this, roughly 30 years old. NBC's Tom Costello has more on what they're doing to update that system and whether this outage was intentional or just human error. Good day. The Department of Transportation says it does not know if this was intentional or if it was human error that somehow they believe contract employees within the FAA damaged critical files in a critical computer system that the FAA relies upon to send vital information to pilots nationwide. When that information somehow got corrupted, when the data got corrupted, the FAA tried to reboot the system, then started stuttering. That caused the FAA to essentially hit the brakes, put the brakes on a pause on all departures on Wednesday. And as you know, the delays and the cancellations started growing through the day, 11,000 delays by the end of the day. The FAA says it has now acted, uh, denied access to those contract employees, and is doubling down on computer uh, protocols and best practices and cybersecurity to ensure this doesn't happen again. In the meantime, we now know that this NOTAM computer system is running on 30-year-old software, 30 years old, not due to be completely replaced for another six years. The FAA Secretary Buttigieg at the Department of Transportation tells me he's asked whether they can accelerate replacing that system. Congress has allocated the money, but it's not an overnight fix. It does take time. And the FAA right now is evaluating whether they can move even faster. In the meantime, again, the investigation continues into whether this was intentional or human error. Back to you. After the break, we're learning new details about a six-year-old boy who shot his teacher last week with a gun he brought from home. Now Tonight continues next.
It appears now that a school employee searched a six-year-old student's backpack before he was later accused of shooting his teacher last week. It appears the school worker got a tip that the child had a gun, but school officials say no weapon was found. Police have accused the six-year-old of shooting his first grade teacher. The bullet went through her hand and into her chest, and yet somehow she still managed to usher more than a dozen of her students to safety before getting medical help. NBC's Gary Grumbach is following this story for us. Gary, uh, just such horrific details here. Update us on the investigation. And I, as I understand it, we're also hearing the school has been in contact with Rob Elementary in Uvalde, Texas, for advice. Yeah, Jake, tonight we're learning that the Newport News Police Department was not notified ahead of time about a tip that the school was aware of that the student might have been in possession of a weapon before the shooting actually took place. We've learned over the past 24 hours, as you mentioned, that the six-year-old arrived to school late, and when he did, his backpack was searched by the faculty inside that school office. We don't know if at that point the student's jacket or pockets were searched at that point, but two hours later, he ended up shooting his teacher. We do know that the gun the child used was his mother's, which had been purchased legally. And as for the victim, his 25-year-old teacher, she's still hospitalized. But we're told her condition has been improving over the past few days. Jake? And Gary, you spoke to Virginia Governor Youngkin about the case. What did he tell you? Yeah, this shooting really added to what has become a long list of shootings across the Commonwealth all year. We discussed this shooting in a wide-ranging interview that I had with the governor earlier this week. And what his plans is to prevent a shooting from like this from happening ever again. Here's what he had to say. We also need to recognize that we don't actually use the gun laws on the books. And in fact, we need to prosecute. And when there's a crime committed with a gun, that we, in fact, need to prosecute. Are you suggesting prosecute a six-year-old? Well, I, we've never dealt with this. And so this six-year-old circumstance is, is really something so out of the norm. Now, Jake, in the wake of the mass shootings at UVA and in Chesapeake, the governor introduced a $230 million plan that's going to overhaul the behavioral health system across the Commonwealth. It's going to provide mobile crisis centers, but, and it's going to provide some telehealth efforts, but it wouldn't change any of the gun laws that currently exist in the state. Jake? Gary Grumbach with a tough assignment. Gary, thank you so much. Turning next to the origins of the universe and a glimpse at the very edge of space. Before we go, a look at the wonders that the Webb telescope is capturing. Stay with us. The new James Webb telescope keeps making new discoveries. It recently confirmed its first exoplanet. It's a small and rocky world that's nearly the same size as Earth, and it's the latest from the NASA telescope that has brought us stunning photographs of our universe. Yet, those images could not be possible if it weren't for the help of two people. NBC's Harry Smith has more. Let's take you back to high school physics class and the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It's this big wide thing. There are microwaves and there's gamma rays and there's radio waves, all of this stuff that's out there. But what we can see is about this big, ultraviolet light on this side, infrared on that side. And if you could see with infrared into space, just imagine. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. It was just over a year ago the Webb telescope was launched into space by an Ariane 5 rocket. Last summer, we saw the first pictures, and the world was wowed. No one had ever seen space this way before. Views from the edge of the universe brought to us by Webb and these two, working from a tiny office in Baltimore at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Visual developers Joseph De Pasquale and Elisa Pagan. Joe worked on the first image beamed back from Webb, the Tarantula Nebula. Realizing that I was literally the first person in the world to ever see the way this is going to look as it's you know transmitted across the world and millions of people see it, that was just a very overwhelming moment for me. I actually, teared up a little bit. <laughs> I hear I hear a little wavering in your voice as you talk about it. Yeah, it was powerful. The telescope, 30 years in development at a cost of $10 billion, can see in the dark, much like night goggles used by soldiers or firemen. Light from stars and galaxies far, far away fade through time and space, but they can be seen 
through an infrared camera. So this is really, really deep. This is looking at the, the first galaxies. The reddest galaxies here are some of the first galaxies to form after the Big Bang. Like 14 billion years ago? Right, and we're detecting that light now with Webb. Closer to home, take a look at the Carina Nebula, a star nursery, so to speak, in our very own Milky Way. You did this one? Yes. OK, all right. I fought for it. <laughs> Elisa took the black and white raw image from Webb and assigned colors to different infrared wavelengths. It's called chromatic ordering. The okay. shortest wavelength is the bluer color, right. and the longest wavelength is the redder color. And because there is no horizon in space, Elisa aligned it to a provocative perspective. We adjusted the orientation purposely to make it feel more grounded and yeah. to show that this is like a mountainous region. And in case you are wondering, how big is this? Basically, from the bottom of the image to the top of this peak is about four light years. <laughs> and a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. It's about six trillion miles. So... <laughs> Elisa, do you ever get overwhelmed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I get overwhelmed all the time. Yeah. I mean, first I think, how am I the one to be able to do this? Perhaps because the one time and still sometime Baker never dreamed she'd have a job as cool as this. My mom is from El Salvador and my dad's from Puerto Rico. What does it mean to be an immigrant's child and to have achieved what you're achieving right now? It does feel really good and I'm happy to be doing outreach where people can see like, oh, that's someone that looks like me and I could be them and I like to help people feel like they could do anything they want to do. Back in that tiny office, we watched as Elisa and Joe worked on a new image. What are we looking at here? NGC 346. Oh, but I know that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a well-known nebula mm -hmm. in the large Magellanic clouds. It's our responsibility to describe what we were observing here. Poly right, polycyclic, yeah. aromatic, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. Yeah. But to be honest, we haven't a clue. It felt like it looked like an, a lamp. And so this is our final image that we have here. Wow. Science and art in perfect harmony. There's some optimism, Joe, I think, that goes with this kind of work. Absolutely. Yeah. Going back to the Carl Sagan quote of we are star stuff, we are the universe. And when we look in these images and we're pondering the universe, we are the universe attempting to understand itself. Humans do cool things sometimes, and that story is not the only good news that we have for you tonight. Here are also your 60 seconds of joy. Rihanna has just released a trailer for the Super Bowl halftime show, but she's hinting that she may be dropping new music as well. The trailer opens with media voices speculating when she'll release new tracks, and that's when she shushes the voices while her song Needed Me plays. A lottery winner got lucky after winning over $15 million in, uh, this is going to sound corny, but I'm not making it up, the town of Luck. A man bought his ticket at a grocery store in the small Wisconsin town. One cashier says people are now lining up before tonight's drawing for the Mega Millions to also get some of that luck. I would buy a t-shirt if I were there. And a video of dogs boarding a bus on their own in Alaska has gone viral. You can see the pups hopping into their assigned seat next to their buddies. The puppy bus is run by a husband and wife's dog walking business. They started videos just for their clients, but the wife says somewhere along the line, the puppy bus took off, it's got a life of its own, and now the internet is in love. That does it for us tonight. I'm Jake Ward for Now Tonight, and the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.